We don't have a specific passage we're going to go to today, and this drives me crazy as a pastor, as a preacher of the gospel, but, but I really felt like today's sermon needed to be more of a topical approach, and I think you'll see why when I start telling you what we're going to be talking about. Uh, the last few weeks, we started a series called On the Money, and On the Money has been, uh, really, the last couple of weeks, we've kind of been building up uh, to get ready for, for the more practical side of money. Uh, but the first week, if you were here, we talked um, about money, and then we talked about this idea of contentment. And what we said is that when we seek to make a lot of money, most of us are really chasing something called contentment. We're chasing some satisfaction, some state of being in our lives, and we falsely believe that the, if we can just make another dollar, then we'll finally be really set, and we'll be able to kind of kick back, relax, and enjoy the flight, so to speak. And, and we're chasing after this state of mind, if you will. Uh, but what we found in that first week of, of sermon is that uh, contentment isn't found in our external circumstances. Contentment's something uh, that we have to find in Christ alone. And we find it through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, even though he was in prison, was able to find contentment. And so uh, contentment is possible no matter what your financial status is. Last week we talked about con- uh, the idea of stewardship. That we are not owners of anything. No matter um, who you are in this room, no matter how much you think you've you've accumulated in your life, I want to tell you something. Ultimately, there is an owner, and his name is God. And God owns all things. Uh, Nothing truly belongs to us, and I can prove it to you. Uh, When you pass away, you're going to have zero ability to carry the things that are quote-unquote yours with you. The only way that you're going uh, to make it into eternity it is with your soul. You're not taking anything with you. That's because God owns everything. Uh, he is the one who created it. He is the one who designed it. He even designed us, and he has a purpose for our lives. And we talked about our purpose then is wrapped up in being good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. And we've all been entrusted with different things. Well, today we're going to go very practical on some things that I think will be helpful to you. And I, and I don't think it's going to be the first time you've heard some of this. But it is something we need to be reminded of. And some of y'all, it's, it may be the first time you've heard what God has to say about some financial things. Uh, today we're talking about just managing money. And, and what we're going to be talking about are some principles from the scriptures uh, that, that will help us manage our finances so that our finances aren't managing us. Okay? Uh, there, there's an old saying that I think Dave Ramsey says. It says, you must learn to manage your money or it will manage you. I don't know if you know the definition of manage, but it's this, to handle or direct with a degree of skill. Now, if you were to look at your checkbook, and some of you are like, I don't have a checkbook, okay, I'm, I'm going to get with you, okay? If you were to look at your uh, bank account, um, or you were to, look to, to just look in your wallet, you would have to be honest, many of you, and say, I don't think I have a lot of skill in what I've been managing. As a matter of fact, I feel like I'm more of a product of my environment rather than a participant. Right now, we, we, we've, had, we've just come out of a lot of inflation, and it is starting to come down some, but it is at the height. In 2022, we just had this incredible explosion of inflation in our country, and I understand that that hit all of us, right? It, it, the dollar doesn't go as far as it used to, and, and the reality is, is, is some of us may be weathering that better than others. But some of us, if we're not careful, we begin to look at our finances and the economy as something that we, it's just kind of out of our control. We're just products of the environment. Well, the reality is, is we are products of it to a certain extent, but we're also products of our own poor choices at times as well. Even when the economy takes a downturn, how we've handled them up to that point will determine how we weather the storm. And so we're going to be talking about managing our finances today in a very practical way. But before I do, I want to read you some stats that I thought was really interesting. It says, 34% of Americans have zero dollars in savings. That means that any emergency or unexpected expense can completely derail their lives. Um, And I want you to know, this is not to beat anybody up. This is not to, 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 to hammer you or make you feel bad. It's just the facts. I just want you to hear them. 66% of millennials have zero dollars in retirement savings. Now, if you're like me, when you hear millennial, you'll think, well, yeah, but they're super young. Of course they don't have any savings, right? Did you know millennials were born from 1981 to 1999? That means that in that 66% of millennials that don't have retirement, that includes people from 25 to 43 years old. 
that's not as young as we think. And when you start talking about getting ready for retirement, that's not young at all. 84% of millennials, I'm picking on millennials, 84% of millennials are underinsured. And that means that if something were to happen to them, and especially if they're the quote-unquote primary breadwinner of their home, they don't have enough life insurance to care for their family if needed. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 76% of millennials are financially illiterate meaning they don't even know really how to handle their finances. They're completely unaware of it. 100 million Americans have outstanding auto loans. 44.7 million have student debt. 43% of student loan borrowers are not making their payments. When I read these stats, it's clear to me that we have a financial crisis in our culture. Would you all agree with that? Would you all agree that money is not really being managed, but maybe money is managing us? Is that, is that a little bit true maybe in your house, that if you were really honest with yourself, some of those numbers kind of gut punch you, and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm in that group. I'm, I'm in the group that, man, if something happens this week, I am going to be derailed. I, I can't even get sick because I can't miss an extra day of work. I can't, I can't miss a week or the whole thing will come tumbling down. Well, I know that a lot of y'all, maybe that's not how you're living. I know that some of y'all, you are. And this sermon is not to punish you. It's to hopefully enlighten you that God's word has a different way for you to live your life. And the wisdom we can get from God's word on managing finances will lead you to the financial freedom you so desire. I promise you. And these principles aren't to get you rich per se, but these principles, when put into practice, will help you find freedom no matter how much money you make. All right, so the first one we're going to be talking about is dealing with debt. Debt's a major issue in our culture. It's so easy to go into debt. I I don't really go into shopping malls much anymore. I really don't. Uh, But I I know that used to, when you would go into a shopping mall, when you walked into like Sears, y'all remember Sears, right? There was a person stationed right at the entrance to Sears. Y'all remember this? And what they want to know, would you like to sign up for a Sears credit card today? And then you go down the the way, and and you go to JCPenney's, and you spend $5.31, and they're like, would you like to get 20% off on your purchase today and sign up for a JCPenney's card? I'm like, I don't know if I really want to take a ding on my credit for a buck 15, but thanks for the offer, right? And then you go down, and it's endless. You can go buy jewelry in credit. You can buy clothing with credit. You, You can buy everything you can imagine on credit, right? Most of the phone sitting in your pocket is actually probably on credit. You're, you signed up with AT&T and it's just part of your monthly bill. It, it's, it's on credit. Everything is on credit, it seems like nowadays. And it's so easy to get credit. I was in Mexico a few years ago and Julie and I went to this resort and we had some kind of financial mix up on our reservation. Now, at that time, I was Dave Ramsey it to death. What I mean by that is I'm like, I don't need them credit cards, okay? And so I didn't have any credit cards. And they had a problem with my payment, and the guy was new, and he swiped my debit like eight times in a row for several thousands each time. And when it's not working, cha-ching, it's not working, cha-ching, he did that over and over until finally what happened? He exhausted my resources. Now, all these were pending And they were going to be cleared up in 24 hours, but I was in Mexico that night. I needed a place to sleep. So I didn't have a credit card to to, to fix it. And so I called. Thankfully, it was in office hours at our local bank. I'm going to give Community National Bank some props here. I called. I said, Jason, I'm homeless down here in Mexico. you got to fix it. And so the bank here worked with me to get some cash, and, and I was taken care of. Thankfully, I didn't have to sleep with the cartel. Anyway, I got home. As soon as I got home, I got online, and I spent five minutes filling out a credit app and had $20,000 credit in five minutes. And I'm like, man, I don't know that I trust me that much, right? Like, like I don't really know that I would give me $20,000 in five minutes. Like, I love y'all, but when I've known you for five minutes, I'm not giving you credit, $20,000 in credit, right? Some of y'all, the longer I know you, the less you'll get, right? I mean, that's just the reality, right? I mean, it's not like um, knowing you more is going to help, right? The more, if that credit card company would have known me for the next 10 minutes, they probably would have diminished it, right? That's just true. But it's so easy to get it. 
Debt is so easy to get into and so difficult to get out of. Well, what does God's word say about debt? Is it forbidden? I mean, if you listen to Dave Ramsey, and I'm a Dave Ramsey fan, okay, I am. I don't want you to, I, I, we have his book in the, in, in, the, in the bookstore over there. We recommend it. We think it's great. But I'm not going to say I'm absolutely a hater of debt like Dave Ramsey. I think he has an opinion, and I think it's a good opinion, and I think it works for a lot of people. And I, I think we should teach that. I really do. But when you go to God's word, here's what it says in Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. What, what Proverbs is saying is, look, when it comes to borrowing something, when it comes to borrowing money, when it comes to borrowing items, whatever it is, when you borrow something from someone, you kind of become a slave to that thing or that person, whether you mean to or not. Uh, you might say, well, Chris, that's kind of harsh. That's kind of strong language. But that's what the Scripture says. It says when you borrow something, you become somewhat of a slave to that thing that you borrow from, and they somewhat become a master over you. Well, what does that look like? Well, well I did the math for you, okay? You're not going to have to do all the math. But, but here's what that looks like. If you look at the average new car payment in the U.S. right now, it's $726 a month. $726. Some of y'all are so old in here, your first car didn't cost $726. Amen? I, I hate to do it. Brother Jerry Don, did your first car cost more than $726? It did not. How much did it cost? 550 big ones. Man, that's not bad. But it's a different time, right? $726 a month. The median salary in the U.S. is $63,795. I did the math on this. I took the annual salary divided by 12 months. This is not taking out taxes. Y'all ready to hear this? Not taking out taxes. You break it down to a 40-hour work week, and you come out that it costs you about six hours a month to pay that note. Now, if, if you add taxes to it, that's more like seven to eight hours a month. Now, now you're like, what are you getting at, Chris? Here's what I'm getting at. When you make that agreement with that creditor, what you're saying is, you now have control over my life, at least in the form of eight hours per month, that I can't do anything else with. I can't be with my family those eight hours. I can't just go to a ball game for those eight hours. I can't just go read those eight hours. I can't just go relax those eight hours. Those eight hours, I have to give up, or you're going to send the popo after me, right? I mean, that's kind of what's going on. You, you've enslaved yourself. And you're like, well, yeah, but that's not bad. I mean, some of y'all are like, I'd give eight hours up for a $720 car note. That's good money. But let's go a little further. What about when you add the mortgage on top of it? The average mortgage in the U.S. right now is $244,000. And then when you add a couple of credit cards for your trip that you took, that you really didn't need to spend all that, but it's, you're only here once, right? I'll be honest, Julie and I went to Hawaii this, this summer. It was an amazing trip. And it's one of those things you're like, I'm, when am I coming back? Swipe, right? Shark diving, swipe. Oh, good, they, we messed up the appointment. We don't have to do that. Thank you, Jesus, right? But, but we just, just spin left and right, and pretty soon... You get back home and you look at your bill and you're like, dear goodness gracious. This is not a once in a lifetime. This is the last trip we'll ever take, right? What I'm, what I'm getting at is this. It's so easy to swipe it. But when you start looking at how much it costs, every single agreement you make is like another shackle on your life. And, and sure, there, there's a place, right? Most of us don't have $244,000 just laying around to go buy a house. So I'm not saying that debt is wrong. What I'm saying is that debt should be approached with great caution. Debt should be approached with great caution because every bit of it you accumulate, you become a slave to the creditor that you signed on with. And pretty soon you can see some of us in this room, man, we've got a shackle of a car payment on one leg, we've got a shackle of a house payment on a leg, uh, some of us have a shackle of a student loan payment on an arm, a shackle of a credit card on another arm, right? And then your kids go to college, and man, they just shackle you on the neck and just pull you down, right? It just, it just gets more and more. And pretty soon, you're making more than you ever made, and you're more shackled than you've ever been. 
and we begin to find ourselves unhappy, disgruntled. Our marriage is not working right. Our, our, our family relationships are strained. Our, our relationships at work are, are having trouble when there's always this underlying current. We're actually just slaves, and we can't see the forest for the trees because everybody around us are doing the same thing. It's hard to see the state of your condition when you're at the bottom of a ship when everybody's rowing with you. It's hard to see it. But when you step outside of it and look at God's Word and go, that makes sense. I get that. I know, you know, Julie and I used to make so much less money than we do now. But can I say that we're more financially free than we ever were? I can't say that right now. Because what happens is you get a raise, and what do you do? You just spend a little more. And you get a raise, and you spend a little more. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But pretty soon, we've got to understand that debt shackles us and we are somewhat enslaved to the things that we buy when debt is involved because we have to trade time for money. I don't know how your job works, but that's how mine works, right? Like, I'm pretty confident here at the church. I'm, I'm going to go on a limb here. I'm pretty confident, this is, I'm spitballing, that if I didn't show up for four weeks in a row, something in my pay would be affected, right? I know what the clinic that when I work there, if I don't show up, I don't get paid. You're just like that. It's your job, right? I don't know if any, any of your bosses are out there going, you know what, let's just give them an extra 1000 this week. You know, That's just not happening. You're trading time for money. You're trading freedom for money. And the money is needed because we're in debt. And once again, I'm not saying that is wrong. I'm just saying it should be approached with incredible caution because we should be very cautious when accumulating debt since it will determine the amount of freedom we have in our lives. Y'all got that? Dealing with debt is a major part of being financially free. And God's Word has something to say about it. Number two, spending with margin. Proverbs 21.20 says this, Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. And now what is he saying here? Because this is kind of, you know, I don't keep oil and precious treasure in my house for the most part. But what he's saying is, look, when you're a wise man, you will keep this stuff around and not use it all up at once. He's saying wise people make sure they have enough margin, if you will, but foolish people devour it. This idea is that not that, look, look at what it says, it's not describing the difference between a wise man and a foolish man in the sense of their ability to acquire something. He's saying it's what they do with what they acquire that determines whether they're wise or foolish. Remember what we said last week, we're not going to be accountable for the things that we don't have. We're going to be accountable for what we do with what we do have. And he said when you've been given something, when you've been given something to steward, wisdom would say, make sure you build enough margin in your life so that you're not living one disaster away from the end. Just one emergency away from disaster. Uh, just one emergency away uh, from, 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 you know, bankruptcy. He says, make sure that you build margin in your lives. And Proverbs says, a foolish man devours it. What he's saying is, look, wise people know that they're not always going to have smooth sailing, and so they keep some things around for when the days get kind of dry. But foolish people devour it all. It's an issue of margin. Andy Stanley, whether you agree with him or not, has a series that he, he preached years ago called Guardrails. One of the best series, I think, that's been out there in a long time. And, and Guardrails, what I liked about this series is it was talking about margin in every area of your life. And, and if you think about this principle, it's true, but it's especially true in finances. He said, look, you don't put a guardrail so close to the edge of a cliff that by the time you hit it, you're doomed. You put it in a safe zone, so to speak, so that if you bump up against the guardrail, you still have some margin before disaster. That's what Proverbs is saying. Wise people put distance between what they spend and disaster. There's, they put a distance between where they live and the cliff. A lot of us, if we're honest, we don't think about that, right? We think about, if you were raised like some of us were, right? Some of y'all, this is foreign to that this was taught, okay? I want you to know, not everybody in this room was taught the same thing about money. Some of y'all were taught, you save, and you save, and you save, and, and it's, it's paid off. It's been great for you, right? But, but some of us may have been taught, 
if I can afford the monthly payment, I buy it. Right? Go into a car lot right now. Go, go to a, an auto dealer. What's the first question they're going to ask just about? How much can you afford? Not how much should you spend. They don't, I mean, if you're a car, I'm not trying to bash you, but they don't care about how much you should spend, right? You don't go to the car lot and they're like, I don't know, man. You look like you might not just, I've never had a, 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 a car salesman do that, ever. I've never had one come out to me and go, you know, look at the way you're dressed. I'm not sure that's a wise move, sir. Have y'all had that? Never had that. I have never once. And they shouldn't, right? That's their job to sell cars. But the question is, how much can you afford? The idea that we've adopted in many of our lives is, if I can afford it, why not? The problem is, is we do that enough with enough things that pretty soon we've maxed out what we can afford and we're living at 98, 99% capacity of what we can absorb. And there's just no margin for if anything goes wrong. And things go wrong, amen? And when you see this the most, it seems like, you know, you don't even notice that the washing machine went out when you have plenty. But man, when, you, when you're living that close to the edge and the washing machine goes out, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal, right? When you're living that close to the edge and, and the motor starts knocking a little funny, it, it's a big deal. And your prayers begin to go up and they're kind of humorous. Dear Lord, please get in my V8. I pray that you would lubricate the parts of this engine so that it'll last at least another 50,000 miles or until I can trade it in, right? We, we start praying these outlandish prayers because we are living beyond our means or we're living so close to the edge that if anything happens, we're doomed. You, you put a guardrail, see what, what a guardrail is, you put it in close enough that there's enough margin left over that when something happens and you have to ram into the guardrail, the desire is that you, it might be painful, but at least you're still alive. Financially, you have to spend less than you earn so that when something comes up that's unexpected and you bump into it, it's still painful, it still costs you, but at least you're not eating ramen noodles for the next month and a half. Just like college again, right? Isn't it funny how you grow out of the taste for cheap stuff? Right? Ramen used to be amazing. Now nah, it's, it's okay. But what I'm getting at is this, but you've got to spend less than you earn if you want to have financial freedom. That's what God's Word says. Wise people keep it. doesn't mean they hoard it. We're not talking about being greedy. But it is talking about living with some margin in your life that you're not just spending everything that you get all the time. When you get that raise, do you look at it as an opportunity to be more financially free or an opportunity to just get more that you want? You see, there's a difference. And I'm preaching to me on this, right? I really am. Don't, don't think that I'm sitting here preaching at you. I'm preaching for all of us. It's a challenge. Spend less than you earn if you want to have financial freedom. And thirdly, and this is the last one we're going to cover today, is earn consistently. Uh, this is kind of one that seems like common sense, but I'm going I'm I'm to preach it anyway because I think it's, it's lacking in our culture. And you know me, guys, I love every generation, and I'm not one that bashes a single generation. I'm not. But I will tell you, younger generation, junior high, high school, early 20s, listen up. This seems to be a principle that is dying with our current generation that's coming up. I really believe it, and I don't mean that harshly. And I don't mean it as, a, I, mean, I say it as a blanket statement, but I know it's not true of every individual. Don't think that. But it is true in this culture. And here's, here's what I'm getting at is the idea that I can have everything that I ever dreamed about but not have to work very hard. Proverbs says this in 10, chapter verse 4, it says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Now, we're not talking about trying to get rich here. There's, it's a principle he's laying out. And it says, He who gathers in the summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in the harvest is the son who brings shame. He's saying there's two ways of living your life. And one, you can kind of be lazy, you can be slack, you can kind of just meander through when it's time to, to work and get out. You're just kind of kicked back, not really doing what you need to do. Because the time to gain that is in harvest. The time to figure out what you're going to eat in the off season is when it's in season. Amen? It is. That's just a reality of life. If you want to 
if you really want to be financially free, then you're going to have to understand that it's consistently doing hard things. He says a slack can causes poverty, but the hand of the what? Of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a son who brings shame. What's the writer saying? He's saying you've got to understand something about how the world works and how how this principle is going to affect your life. Uh, If you're going to sit around and not produce anything in your life, don't be surprised when the time gets hard that you don't have enough. And the reason I say it affects this generation is, man, I feel old when I say this, okay? Don't, I like to be cool and trendy, but I'm going to sound old. It's that social media that we have today, okay? It is. There's a truth to this. Follow me for just a minute. You get on social media right now, and there are, there are gurus. Right? I never knew we had so many experts among us. How about y'all? I mean, you know, there's, we have experts everywhere. I, I try to get fit-ish, okay? I do. I'm going to give you all an opportunity. You can hold me accountable. I signed up for a 5K on Thanksgiving Day. Now, don't tell me you shouldn't be eating that, preacher. I don't want to hear that nonsense. What I want to hear is how's your training going, preacher? You can say that, okay? Hold me accountable. When you see me about to die on the road, I'm not dying. I'm training, okay? If I'm laying in the ditch shaking, just kind of help me back up and push me going, okay? Okay? But I, I think it's hilarious because I see all these influencers, and they'll be fitness influencers. They'll be 21 years old, and they'll be telling you, man, I just don't, you know, people are so lazy nowadays. They'll be telling you how it's just not that hard to maintain a six-pack. And I'm like, all right, Junior. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you're 21, it's pretty easy to be in shape, right? You sleep an extra hour, and you lose five pounds when you're 21, right? It really is. It's insane. Wait 20 years. I told my boys, I said, look, there's a reason God lets you age slowly. If he gave it to you all at once, you'd want to just end it all right now. Like, it's, you can't handle it. It's like you can't handle the truth. You can't handle it. If you got 20 years of aging right now, you'd be like, dear gosh, this life, I don't know if it's worth living, preacher. Like, it's rough. Oh, that's normal, right? I get up every day with something else hurting. I, I didn't even know I had that many body parts. What am I getting at? We live in a culture, though, that tells you that everything's easy. Everything's quick. Everything's fast. And it doesn't even take much work. I'll see people say, oh, man, I became a millionaire because I did these 10 easy things. Or these, these, I got this rental property, and this was so easy. And I'm like, I really don't buy it. But, but let's say that that's true. Let, let's say that it actually is true. There are some people who get extremely wealthy without having to work very hard. There are people like that, right? Uh, you have these influencers who are making millions of dollars for taking selfies. I don't know. I don't get it. Right? I mean, I'm, let's just be honest. How ridiculous. I, right? Like 80,000 likes. I'm like, Julie, get the phone out. I'm taking a picture. Right? Like, uh, right? Like, the problem is I, I, I evidently lack some qualities that make money. Anyway. What I'm getting at is this. We have a culture that has bought into this idea that money and getting rich or whatever you may say is just so easy. And if, and if it's hard, you're, a, you're, you're duped. You're a fool. The reality is this. As a general principle, to be financially free takes consistently working hard over time. If you're looking to get rich in your 20s, good luck. Very few people will find that. But if you want to be financially free, consistently begin to do the work of producing something with your life over time. And you'll be amazed at what you see come to bear because of it. I was reading an article, getting ready for this, and um, they were telling, they were, I was reading about the top five careers for millionaires. Preacher was not one of them, by the way. Um, Go figure. Anyway, but I was reading them. Here's the top five occupations. I think it's important because the fifth one's going to blow most of your mind. Engineers, number one. Accountants, that makes sense because they know what to do with their money. Managers, I don't know what that even means really. Attorneys, you ready for number five? What do you think the fifth out of the 
all millionaires, this is the number five profession for producing millionaires. What do you think it is? Teachers. So I don't want to hear this nonsense anymore from you teachers. I don't want to hear this. We well, don't make enough money. I know you're getting kickbacks. All them extra glue sticks, right? It's fact. I don't, I don't, don't blame me. Don't shoot the messenger. But, but I begin to read why. It said out of the vast majority of millionaires, only 31% have ever made over $100,000 in one year. 31% have never made $100,000 in a year. 31% of, of these millionaires have never made over $100,000 in a year. You know why that matters? Because it lines up with this principle from Proverbs. That when you will just gather in the summer, working consistently, diligently, over time, that is the most consistent way to become financially free. I need a teacher to take me to lunch today. <laughs> Financial freedom is found most of the time through consistent earnings. And, and let me just give you one more tidbit, and this is a little soapboxish, but if you will indulge me because we're just about done. Husbands, men, especially in your house, you are the one that God has given the task to care for your home. I want you to hear me. Y'all know my wife works. I'm, I'm not saying your wife can't work. But, but I, I see this coming through a lot of my counseling nowadays. I see it coming through a lot of conversations nowadays. Uh, of husbands who are just like, I'll be honest, they're, I don't know how to say it, and I'm not trying to be rude, but they're just kind of dead weight in a marriage. And the wife's going out and working, making all the income, and he's just kind of hanging out at home, playing video games. I don't know what he's doing, right? And I'm sitting there going, guys, if you want a woman to respect you, never let her outwork you. Husbands, she might out-earn you, but she should never outwork you. She should never outwork you. You are God's man in your home. You need to set the temperature and the thermostat for the effort put in to what you bring into that home. Financial freedom is found most of the time through constant earnings, consistent earnings. It's not found through a get-rich-quick scheme most often. It's found through consistently doing the right things over and over and over until there is a harvest to be seen. Teachers, I expect more from you. <laughs> I'm going to start monitoring our tithing situation. We're going to start putting the career next to it. And if I don't see teachers... We're going to have to deal with it. No, I'm joking. All joking aside, you know, I mean, it's just the data's there. So earn consistently. So, so we're going to conclude and kind of wrap it up. We're not going to have a time of invitation today, but we're going to kind of wrap it up this way. I want, I've got a question. What area or areas has these passages prompted you to consider in your own financial life? Maybe changes that need to be made. As you read these passages, as you hear this word, is there something in your life that you're like, that needs to change? My, my hope is that from a sermon like, like this, from hearing the Word of God and the wisdom of the principles laid down, that we would not just take it and go, wow, I'm more informed, but that we would take it and actually make some changes in our lives because of it. But maybe you're out there and you're like, I'm a millennial. I'm financially illiterate. You said so, right? Maybe you're out there all joking aside and you're like, I don't really know how to make this work. My parents didn't do it. My spouse's parents didn't do it. I'm in a certain situation that's different, whatever it is, and you don't really know how to make that work. Can I tell you all one of the coolest things I think we have at Round Prairie is this. We have some people in this church that really God has blessed, and they have really learned these principles and lived them out for decades. And, and, and every time I preach a financial series, I give this offer, and every time people take me up on this. If you want someone to sit down with you, not judging you, but sit down and help you look over your finances, look over your budget, look over your spending, look over your savings, look over your plans for the future. We have excellent people in this church that love to come alongside other people and help. And every time I've preached this sermon, we've had at least some takers for that offer. Guys, I highly encourage it. If you're one of these people and you're just living paycheck to paycheck, you're embarrassed. Let me tell you, don't be embarrassed. I would venture to say that most of us have been there. I'd venture to say that every pastor has been there. But I want you to have the freedom from your finances so that you can live the life God has called.
called you to live. Some of us right now, let's just be honest, it'd be hard to be obedient to God to do certain things because, man, we can't miss a day of work. We can't miss a week because if we miss, we don't get paid. And, man, one week, it's game over. I'm going to challenge you to consider what the freedom could look like in your life if you submitted your life to these principles. And then see what God would do. You don't have to fix it all tomorrow. You really don't. What do they say? You, you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Most, most of us in this room, Miss Claudia looked, elephants? It's a metaphor. Anyway, we're not going to have an elephant for, for breakfast. But anyway, I don't know. Anyway, it's, uh, but the idea is this, that you, you don't get caught up into the idea that it's just too big. I can't do anything about it. It would be amazing to see what could happen if you begin to execute these steps every day. I guarantee you, you'd be amazed at how far you'd be in a year, and in two years, and in three years, and in four years. You get it, right? So what's God calling you to do? If you want to talk to someone, make sure to find me after the service. I've got people on speed dial that love to help people with these kind of issues. And so y'all let me know.